please. Thank you, Esther, for the invita uh, for the invitation for this um, webinar series and for the introduction. Um, we are talking uh, in the name of a big research team today. Um, we have uh, eight researchers in our team. Um, one of them is Abel Beremini, who cannot be here today, but uh, I will talk about the paper that I jointly authored, co authored with him. And uh, I'm not telling you the other names because um, it would be a long list, but uh, so all the big work was done uh, by um, multi, like, like by senior and junior researchers. Uh, gender was uh, like men, women, Roma, non Roma researchers. So it's about an intersectional knowledge production that we are talking about the results are that of results are talking about today. I try to share my screen. Uh, can you see it? Mm -hmm. Yes, but uh, it's not I know I know I will go for slides. Can you see it now? Yes, perfect. Okay, all right. So we gave uh, a title as individual success uh, at the price of a collective failure, uh, citing Diana Ray, uh, who is herself, uh, I think, a working class first generation um, graduate. And uh, I think this, uh, this, you will understand why we chose this title after the presentation. So to, today we are talking about the hidden costs and the consequences of educational mobility for first in family graduates in Hungary. Um, I will try to introduce quickly the research, uh, the main research questions, the methodology and the theoretical framework. Then I will give the floor to Jeanne, um, my co-author and colleagues on the team. Uh, then I will talk about a couple of other results, and then Yulia Bor Yuliana Boros will finish the presentation. Um, so this was a four-year research project that uh, tried to explore the education-driven upward mobility trajectories, their different outcomes, and their corollary prices. We were interested especially in the hidden or emotional costs of upward mobility, and the cost of changing social class among first in family graduates in Hungary. This is kind of a new research topic in Hungary. I know it's a very well established research topic in England and uh, some other countries, but in Hungary, we beforehand, we didn't have researches on the personal experiences of mobility, but the Hungarian sociology was very, very strong in quantity quantitative studies of social mobility. So one of the biggest strengths of the Hungarian sociology is the classical mobility studies. Uh, but we didn't have, hopefully I am correct, but we didn't know much of the qualitative studies of the social mobility experiences. We wanted to fill this gap. So our main research questions was, were like, um, firstly, a systematic analysis of the intersectional effects of class, ethno-racial belonging, gender and generation on the outcomes of social mobility among academic high achievers. So we call academic high achievers those who uh, graduated from a higher education institutions first in their families. Um, and we were interested in the question whether there are differences in the mobility trajectories and the mobility outcomes among the majority, non-Roma Hungarian, and the racialized minority group Roma in Hungary. Um, we tried to find other minority groups in Hungary, but uh, we had very, very few numbers uh, from other minority groups. So statistically, it was not like, um, meaningful to, to talk about them today. Therefore, we decided to talk about majority and minority, majority non-Roma Hungarians and the racialized minority group as Roma. Uh, so we asked the question, how the 
shape the mobility trajectories and how it affects the cost, the price of social ascension and of the hidden injuries of changing class. Um, for our research project, the intersectional lens or the intersectional approach was very important. Um, subjective experiences are absolutely informed by inequality dimensions other than only class. These other inequality axes are like ethnicity, gender, religious belonging. Uh, many of the social mobility studies that, that analyze systematically the personal experiences are concentrating on, on, the, on the effect of class. Um, we wanted to fill this gap as well. We understand the social mobility process as a movement across material and symbolic spaces where different social markers, dispositions, and practices are linked to individuals, class, ethnicity, and gender. Um, we use the intersectionality concept as an approach following by Crenshaw's definition. Um, the intersectionality approach attempts to capture both the structural and the dynamic consequences of the interaction between two or more axes of subordination. It addresses the manner in which racism, patriarchy, class oppression, and other discriminatory systems create background inequalities. And these inequalities structure the rel rel relative positions of women, ethnicities, classes, and the like. Um, I'm not telling you all the uh, research questions now because you can read this slide, but, um, but um, I will soon give the floor to Jeanne, uh, who will talk, who will like talk about one of the main research questions: what is the outcome of the social mobility, uh, depending on the different characteristics of one's mobility trajectories? Um, what I would like to talk about now, very briefly, is that uh, how we the perspective that we used. Um, so our approach follows the Jules Nade approach. Um, it's a sociology of critical capacity perspective, and it recognizes the actor's legitimate capacity to justify their actions and to make sense of their traveling through different social fields. We pay attention to the manner in which actors develop discourses about their actions or the way they implode their actions. Um, for us, this course, however subjective it may be, remains an important indicator of objective structures. And um, the other approach that is characteristic of our project, that we try to challenge the neoliberal discourse about social mobility, this discourse is dominated by the myth of meritocracy which is a neoliberal vocabulary emphasizing the role of aspiration, ambition, and choice, and which considers mobility as an individual project. Instead, we ask how individuals experience mobility in a context where institutional racism has long been widespread, like in Hungary, where social inequality is rising, and where, according to all the major mainstream social mobility studies, social mobility declining. Um, and uh, very briefly about the Hungarian context, there is a huge ethnic gap in educational attainment between the majority and the minority Roma population. Meanwhile, 17% of the total population has university degree. Only 1% of the Roma population possess a university degree. So it's a huge, huge gap. There are many studies that try to explain uh, this big ethnic gap, amazing studies. I'm not talking about them today because of shortness of time, but uh, those who are interested, we can recommend you a lot of literature. And in Hungary, those who are not familiar with the Roma situation in Europe, the Roma are the most marginalized and discriminated against community. It's not only characteristic in Hungary, but in the EU countries as well. Um, just very, very briefly uh, about the theoretical framework that we use. 
We found the Pierre-Bourdieu's analytical tools very fruitful, as many of the other qualitative social mobility studies do. Um, Jeanne will talk about uh, how habitus is such a, a central concept of our study, but um, obviously we use the definition that many researchers use according to which conditions that is of permanent manners of being, seeing, acting, and thinking, or a system of long-lasting schemes or schemata or structures of perception, conception, and action. So habitus is very useful for us as it connects the structural and the individual level and it's a socialized subjectivity. And um, according to Bourdieu's own experience, uh, when there is a mismatch between habitus and the social field when, where one belongs to, there can be a very painfully fragmented self divided habitus experience. Uh, apart from the Bourdieuian analytical tool, we use the theoretical background of the Whiteman studies. We use uh, the Black cultural capital theory or notions, and your source cultural community wealth theory. And very briefly about the methodology, uh, Jeanne told me the other day maybe we shouldn't mention that we made we conducted 175 interviews because people will not believe us. <laughs> But that's why I mentioned that we have a research team of 10 members. And then we had like intern, like interns or like trainees for three months. So basically all together 15 people created these big databases. And we needed that many interviews because we really wanted to um, to track the different uh, upward mobility patterns. And um, we use the interviews with a mixed method. Yeah, so the first part of the interview was a biographical narrative. When we asked the interviewees to talk about for half an hour, 40 minutes, their life and their childhood, their educational career, their work life, their family life. So everything which was important for them according to their own words. And then the second part was uh, what we consider the semi-structured interview, when we asked questions related to our theoretical inquiries that wasn't addressed in the narrative part of the interview. Uh, we took Roma those, we considered Roma those who self-identify themselves as those, uh, in their narrative interviews. And um, we coded all the 175 interviews with a mixed method with both deductive and inductive category formation with the help of the Atlas T software program. We conceptualized the uh, habitus as a reflexive discourse about fitting and not fitting into a field. So Jana will talk about it, what we called in the interview as a dislocated habitus. And what was really important for our research team uh, it was the positionality of the researchers. Uh, we tried to, to be epistemically justice, just. <laughs> so for us, the concept of epistemic justice is really important. Um, so we didn't take um, Roma as only the subject of our inquiry, but we, invited them expert of their own field and then we with the knowledge production it happened as a joint uh, exercise so we had women men we had first generation and multi-generation academic um, yeah academics and we had Roma and non-Roma researchers in our group so Jean, yeah, and we had a couple of publications, but the two most important are a Hungarian book, which just came out in Hungarian because we thought that it's our job, our mission, to try to translate the very well established um, English literature or vocabulary to a Hungarian vocabulary. 
So believe or not, but people of color, the ex expression of people of color sounds really stupid in Hungarian. The expression of black and white are very, very like derogative or I don't know. So we, we had we tried to find out in new language what is kind of established English terms. And there is a special issue in the review of sociology about our main findings. One of them, Jessica, I gave it to you to read. Okay, Jana, it's your turn. Thank you. Uh, as Judith mentioned it, uh, one of the aims of our research was to explore the emotional and psych uh, psychological price that individuals have to pay for social mobility. Our study aimed to examine the specific traits of mobility trajectories of first-generation graduates that influence the price someone pays for mobility. Uh, to study the costs of mobili mobility, we drew on Bourdieu's concept of habitus. According to Bourdieu, habitus is like a fish in water in the social world in which it is created. It doesn't feel the weight of the water, it takes the world for granted. However, in the case of large social change or social mobility, the individual's primary habitus and the habitus required in the new field may become different, that is, a dislocation of habitus may occur. This difference can lead to the isolation of the individual from the environment of origin and the new environment that can have psychological consequences. This is what Bourdieu calls habitus clivé. In our research, we investigated how the characteristics of an individual's mobility trajectory influence the degree of habitus destabilization. Our study found that upward mobility doesn't necessarily lead to habitus dislocation. Certain characteristics of the mobility trajectory make habitus transformation more likely. The subjective experience of mobility is influenced by the range of social mobility, the speed and direction of movement through social space, the person's racialized minority group, the range of geographical mobility, the aspirational capital of the family of origin, and whether mobility is an, in, is an individual or collective experience. The intersection of these factors is what is crucial regarding the experience of mobility, and some individual factors like personality are also play an important role. It was found that those interviews who belong to the Roma minority are more likely to experience the temporary or permanent dislocation of habitus than the majority participants of the study. <clears throat> Upward social mobility was associated with significant mental and emotional stress for several of our interviews, including majority and Roma participants. They talk about this tension using the using uh, terms such as those who live in a schizophrenic life, code between two words, living two lives. In contrast, other interviewees reported a more or less smooth journey psychologically. Some of our interviewees experienced the feeling of not belonging anywhere only at a certain point in their lives, while others felt it throughout their mobility journey. Our results show that our majority interviewees educational mob mobility typically doesn't cause habitus dislocation. However, almost all Roma interviewees, with a few exceptions, have experienced the misfit between their habitus and the field of origin or destination in the shorter or longer stages of their lives. We found that belonging to a racialized minority group has a significant effect on the emotional and and psychological price of mobility. Many of the Roma respondents experienced habitus clivé. This is because racialized minority middle class people have a distinctive, distinctive problem. On the one hand, the frequent experience of discrimination and stigmatization makes the process of acculturation more complex and difficult for them. On the other hand, the question of loyalty to the group of origin is more complicated for Roma interviewees than for the majority res respondents because it arises in the intersection of class and race, while for the majority this question is formulated only in the terms of class. <laughs> Regarding the range of social mobility, our research considers the social distance traveled during mobility to be large if the respondents' parents have pri primary education or less. 
Conversely, if either parent has more than pri primary education, we consider the range of mobility trajectory to be small. Our interviewees who traveled a long range mobility trajectory were more likely to experience habitus dislocation than individuals who traveled a short distance. The speed of mobility also influences the subjective experience of movement. According to our results, if the mobility uh, pass is slow and gradual, then upwardly mobile individuals are less likely to experience the dislocation of habitus. By contrast, if the upwardly mobile person moves straight and fast along their educational paths uh, without interruption, then they are more likely to experience a misfit between their habitus and their new social world. Our results show that the mobility pass or lack of it traveled by the family of origin has a strong influence on whether our interviewees experienced habitus dislocation. Individuals whose family of origin had already followed an upward mobility trajectory typically found it easier to navigate in different social worlds at the same time. In the cases, in these cases, the individual's trajectory is a continuation of the family's transgenerational mobility path. <laughs> we found that moving toward the quadrant of social space and field of occupation dominated and operated by white middle class cultural capital is more likely to cause habitus clivi than moving toward the economically dom dominant quadrant of the social space. Those who arrive at occupations where dominant white middle class cultural capital is required to get on and who didn't acquire the symbolic mastery of it in their family of origin are more likely to experience a mismatch between their habitus and a taint field. Many of our interviewees reflected on the difficulties they face due to the lack of possession of dominant cultural capital, for example, low self-esteem. We found that mobility in a geographical sense also affects the individual's experience of social mobility. Those who lived in the same settlement since birth or moved back to where they lived as children are less likely to experience dislocation, while those who undergo long-range mobility in a geographical sense are more likely to feel it. Those interviewees whose family of origin was ambitious, that is, they had mobility aspirations or had a positive attitude towards mobility and saw education as the most important vehicle for it, usually had fewer conflicts with their family that makes, that makes their mobility trajectory emotionally smoother. We found that aspirational capital, the parents' dreams, hopes, and high aspirations for their children's future is a resource that in most cases promotes a smooth mobility trajectory. <clears throat> Some of our interviewees reported how difficult it was to navigate their mobility journey without fellow travelers who are, who are following a similar path. In contrast, those many Roma respondents who were able to join an educational program or institution that sub supports mobility said it was easier to go through this path with others who had traveled a similar journey. In other words, finding a community made their mobility path easier. Uh, in some, habitus is traveling long distances socially and geographically at a fast speed, moving toward the quadrant of the social space dominated and operated by white middle class cultural capital and originating from families with low levels of, of aspirational capital are more likely to experience habitus clearly. The unique combination and the intersecting effect of these factors significantly influence the subjective experience of mobility. So we analyzed the intersecting effect of these factors to explain why our interviewees pay different prices for their mobility. <clears throat> In the following, uh, you uh, will present uh, our analysis method through a case of some participants. Okay. Um, sorry, I don't know how to show the video. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, so we thought that we bring you two case studies um, to demonstrate or yeah. to illustrate 
what John was speaking about, how these different mobility characteristics of mobility trajectories affect the habitus formation, adaptation of habitus, or the reconciliation of habitus. Um, one is a um, case study of a majority, first in family graduates. Um, and I call her case as the individual, individualized loneliness. So she is a majority um, lady in her early 20s, and she studies law at a top university in, in Budapest. Um, just listen to her narrative. She's coming from, by the way, sorry, a rural little village in an economically backward region in Hungary from working class parents with very low education. They only finish primary school, which means in Hungary, eight grades of schooling. So that's her narrative. Since I've been here at this top university in Budapest, I feel even more alienated from my family. We live in different universe. We have different values. They cannot understand anymore what I'm talking about. They think I became a big-headed show of intellectual of the capital. I feel a stranger in my old social media, but I don't feel as part of the uni community either. I'm in between. I don't have a tangible identity. I don't know who I am because I'm not anymore a working class girl as I used to be, but I'm not yet an intellectual either. How shall I describe myself? Maybe a girl who is looking for to belong to a social milieu where she feels familiar, she feels home. Otherwise, I'm a girl who is a bit sad and who can adopt because she wants to break out of her poorer or working class family's poverty. And now we brought you another case study. Sorry, I, I really don't have time to go into details with this uh, Hungarian majority girl, but I would like to report on the second case study. She's a Roma lady in her middle um, 40s. And uh, on her case, I would like to demonstrate one of the specific mobility trajectory, which we called as the minority mobility trajectories, which Yuri will talk about it as well. Um, so this case study is uh, kind of an illustration of um, this certain mobility trajectory. And uh, the characteristic of this trajectory is that from a dislocated habitus, the path or the trajectory leads to the reconciled habitus. Um, we are using, we, we find very fruitful Ingrams and Abrahams uh, conceptuali conceptualization of the different habitus types. Um, and it's striking how much similarities we have despite of the very different uh, country context. So the characteristics of Lily's mobility trajectory is that she is from a small village, very close by for the other Hungarian lady that I talked to you about a second ago, the same economically backward region, the same parental background, very low schooling. And uh, Lily just went to a local primary school where many, many Roma children went together with her. She felt like a fish in the water, as Janna said. She had no problem at that time being a Roma. Um, she had an interrupted educational trajectory. Um, after finishing her secondary school, um, she attended a rural, not the prestigious university. And then she went, before this university, she went three years working because she had too much of studying. So in the grammar school, she started to feel discrimination every single day, on, a, on an everyday basis. She was the only Roma in her secondary school class. She was the underrepresented minority. And as one of our other interviewees said, as, the, as we go further and further up in the education system, it's getting whiter and whiter. So meanwhile, at primary level, you find many Roma co-students or, or peers in your class or in your school. At the secondary level, is less, less Roma. And at the university, the very typical is that you are the only Roma in your year group. Um, her work destination was Brussels and Budapest. She worked for the NGO and for the academic sector as well. 
Um, Parallel university studies because she came from a very poor family. She always had to work, so she worked in the pro Roma civil sector. Um, her case study, her case is just a, a good illustration of the fact that frustration stemming from the dislocation of habitus can become a resource. Um, some of our first in family graduates uh, who behaved as organic intellectuals, according to the Gramskian note, uh, Gramskian concept. So some of them became the actors of social change, social transformation. So Lily is, was one of them. That's how her narrative goes. I was a uni student in Budapest, and I realized that there is no hope, nothing for those Roma students who come from poor rural families like me. And I also realized that I can never ever be able to make up my knowledge deficit towards my uni mates who came from the elite neighborhoods in Budapest. And from this realization and frustration born the idea of creating Roma Vazitas. This is an educational support program for disadvantaged but very talented Roma university students. Julia, next speaker, uh, will talk more about um, the case study of the Roma Vazitas and how it mitigates the price of social mobility. And Lily's uh, postgraduate studies uh, went hand in hand with her development of her self-reflection. As she says, I consider my whole scientific work as part of my self-development project. I started my PhD studies at the same time as I did my movement therapy course. Um, and a social, a social action, like a strategy of giving back to the community, to those in need, uh, we consider this as a strategy for habitus reconciliation. Mm, for Lily, uh, one way to reconcile her dislocated habitus was to give something back to her oppressed, discriminated against community. However, as an unintended consequence of this social practice, this giving back leads to labor market segmentation, as we argue and as we try to demonstrate it in our paper about the racial uh, class ceiling, racial class ceiling. And um, it also leads to the concentration of from our first in family graduates in helping professions. Um, and we can use Hada, Miklos Hadash's um, concept of dispositional relaxation, as many of our interviewees said that they felt relaxed, cheered among other Roma co-workers or in a Roma sphere of the labor market. So that's how Lily reasoned her choosing to work in academia, but both in the NGO sector. In academia, I have to achieve seven times more to be treated equally with my non-Roma white colleagues. But in the NGO sector, for example, at Roma Vazitas, I feel I found my home. It just got all right that I am a Roma. Thanks to the like-minded Roma intellectual community, I started not to be ashamed, but be proud of being a Roma. I started to consciously work with me being a Roma. Uh, Lily started not to, to really, really fed so for so long during the secondary school to be so ashamed as being a Roma as she didn't even invite her parents for her leaving party at the secondary school. And this was kind of still a traumatic experience for her in her narrative. But I started to consciously work with me being a Roma. Now I use it in a protest way to confront my white colleagues with the recognition that how embarrassing it is that I am the only non-white, the only Roma among them in the Hungarian academic. Um, so just very, very, very briefly now, uh, we identified four main education-driven mobility trajectories. Um, and one of them is the minority mobility trajectories, which is Lily's mobility path. And the minority mobility trajectories, according to our uh, research, has three main elements. One is the recasting the Roma identity, the reconstructing Roma middle class self-perception, meaning that to be a Roma is not anymore a shame, 
but it's a source of pride. As one of them said, I'm still a gypsy, but in a different way. So following Gibson's conceptualization, we call it accommodation without assimilation. It means basically having a foot in two different worlds. The second element of this minority mobility trajectory is that these first in family graduates Roma create and join ethnic uh, organizations that support educational mobility. Yuli will talk about this, and the third one is giving back to the community. So Yuli, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, for some personal information, I joined uh, the team as a Roma researcher. It was uh, very important for me to think together about uh, myself and uh, social mobility. I, uh, uh, it wasn't easy, but I learned a lot. I would like to thank you uh, for always being open, even during our theoretical debate. Uh, I work as a teacher at uh, the University of Page, and uh, also it sounds very good uh, from the outside. It has come at a serious price. I uh, encountered the glass ceiling effect mentioned earlier every day. Uh, unfortunately, I do not speak English well. This is the advantage that I still have uh, compensated. Uh, so I ask for everyone's understanding. And uh, the next, uh, education separate programs uh, for my uh, dams. Our uh, respondents' historical accounts of mobility clearly demonstrate that young first generation students are not. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, yes, uh, I'm not merely passive recipients of newly acquired in support programs, ethnic and social capital, but they can also be active agents who create new resources, new in, uh, activities, or even organizations, relationships, and norms, and actively contribute to reconstruct and redefine their ethnicity and identity. The next slide, you did. Any separate programs not only helped our interviews through ongoing financial difficulties or the structural barriers faced by underrepresented, um, repre um, underrepresented uh, and uh, racialized minority students. They were also provided with navigational capital through the conditions of racial discrimination experienced by many of them on a daily basis. They were offered opportunities to meet Roma peers and peers like themselves, to develop close friendships and dance network of ethnic context, and this gave them a sense of belonging and emotional protection. Thus, these Roma support programs and organizations significantly contributed to reducing uh, the price of upward mobility, elevating the psychological and emotional burden of class change. The next slide. The third characteristic of the typical uh, Roma minority mobility pass in that the majority of uh, stakeholders and are uh, con concentrated in a segment of the labor market, which allows uh, them to help people in vulnerable situations in need or even have their own marginalized uh, communities. The next slide uh, you did because mentioned this information. These uh, separate programs, uh, model programs, um, uh, I um, um, try to uh, this program. Uh, the first, the scholarships model, school that aim to provide financial support to Roma pub, uh, Publius. The, the second, the talent management model. The third, school of opportunity model. The next slide you did. And uh, the special uh, uh, Roma college model, the first non-resident educational college for students in higher education, you did mention, um, uh, established from below, entitled by the first generation of Roma intellectuals, was the Roma Visitors Invisible College. 
which was launched in uh, 1996. The network of higher education special colleges modeled on Roma Vezites became particularly important in the uh, 2010s, uh, 2010s. Uh, 2010. On the one hand, higher education and special colleges provide profession, uh, professional academic assistance, and on the other hand, they play a significant role in providing pre, uh, participating students with a family-like, mostly ethnic community. The next slide. The members of the college become intellectuals by internalizing the values of the community. Social responsibility and the straightening of minority identity go hand in hand with academic expectation of supporting the values of the Roma community and social solidarity and indirectly with giving back to the community. Judith mentioned it. The majority, uh, uh, it's okay, <laughs> the next slide, the next slide. On the one hand, it provided them with navigational capital in discriminatory environment. On the other hand, it also made it possible for them to meet Roma young people like themselves, to establish close friendships and a dance network of ethnic contacts thus experiencing a sense of belonging and emotional protection. The program has succeeded in building Roma culture capital, a wealth of resources that can be successfully used by both lower and middle class Roma youth. Through this, they can give new pos uh, positive meaning to their Roma identity, create networks that ensure togetherness, thus countersenting their frequent experiences of discrimination. The next slide. Conclusion, uh, one of the main benefits of uh, Roma education support programs in relation to Roma social mobility is that they equip, uh, equip uh, their mentees with Roma culture capital. We understand Romani culture capital to be similar to Black culture capital in the sense that it uh, represents a pool of resources that middle class Roma youth can benefit from in order to give their Roma identity a positive meaning. With this complex approach, Roma education program make a significant contribution to elevating the cost of upward social mobility of their beneficiaries. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, a short um, uh, interview of Qt. Uh, the years at Roma Vezites were good and give me a lot of strength. What did I get from that community? They provided me with a monthly uh, stipend, which greatly had my financial situation. I sent half the money home to help my mother. The scholarship also had symbolic value. It sent me the message that the effort I put into learning is appreciated. The years I spent at the Romver, Roma Versitas, also helped me overcome my identity crisis. crisis. They made me realize that being Roma is not a shame, but rather a pride. They gave, they gave me encouragement, self-esteem, solidarity, and taught me to believe in myself. I understood that everything that makes us human helps us feel good in this world. It is thanks to that period that I will never be ashamed of myself again. This kind of English enlightenment has also come to Roma cycles that we think differently about what it means to be Roma. We have become convinced that not only non-Roma, Hungarian, culture has value, but also Roma culture. Thank you. <laughs> Next slide, Judith. And I only would like to conclude this presentation with one sentence, because uh, you could read all the others, and it was already mentioned. So we kind of came to the conclusion that um, the social and racial inequalities uh, should be decreased to diminish the emotional costs of mobility for racialized minority groups. Because in a very unequal uh, society where rationalization is like uh, experienced on an everyday basis, 
um, there is a huge price of social upward social mobility for those who come from oppressed minority groups and who come from working class families. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for the fascinating talk and uh, it's a fast, it's a real very exciting topic. Uh, now I would like to give the floor to Jesse to uh, share her thoughts at the discussion. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, that was a really fascinating presentation and I very much enjoyed also reading your paper beforehand um, and engaging with this work because uh, as I, actually I think we were just, just talking about it before, it's just powerful for me to actually look at how much overlap there is in our work and I've been involved with a lot of qualitative research looking at um, educational inequality and social mobility in the UK context and it's yeah it's just powerful when you have such qualitative data um especially i think because obviously we have more kind of quantitative studies that do look across context and i think your work is so uh powerful to have done such a big qualitative project and get such rich data that points you to these really important issues which is very similar to the work i've done with big qualitative projects and yeah, it just feels very truthful. Um, I was saying to the research team, reading the the article and the quotes and feeling like I could be reading my own research and data from students in the UK. So um, thank you for this important research. And I do, I do feel that it's really interesting and that we should continue these discussions. Um, I wanted to first just really briefly do a shameless plug because I think, I don't know if you have heard uh, of the Paired Peers Project in the UK um, at all, but this is one of the projects I was involved with as well with Nicola Ingram, where a lot of our the work that you've referenced of ours that's um, been useful comes from as well. So we did, the Paired Peers Project is similar in that we've looked at uh, graduates, it, sorry, we tracked 70 students at two different types of universities in the UK, a very elite university and one that's a newer university without the same status. And we looked at students from different social class backgrounds. So again, as you kind of pointed out, the majority of the social mobility work has tended to look at social class. And that is something we did um, in our project. Anyway, we have a qualitative data spanning seven years where we followed these students through their degrees and into the labor market. And we've just, uh, a new book has just been published this week on that project, which this is the second phase of the project. So this book for me is, it is quite relevant to you guys project as well, because here we are tracking the students uh, the graduates and looking at the different uh, barriers that they face in their experience of getting into the labor market now and whether you know um, actually the degrees that they have enables them to overcome any background factors for them and move into occupations that they desire or what kind of challenges they face and I think for me that was something really important in your work that of course is close to my heart the big challenge to to the discourse of social mobility and the idea that just um, going through education, becoming socially mobile, that that will enable you with that qualification to move into the elite. And actually, as we're demonstrating, that is not entirely true. And it and even if it is, it comes with a lot of costs for a lot of people. Um, so yeah, this may be of, of use to the team and I can send the reference if you need. Um, so I just wanted to mention that, and I think um, where have I gone? It's it's just really made me think. I wanted to kind of turn to my chapter that I know has been useful um, and relevant to this work, it, particularly looking at the kind of cleft habitus. So I, I I call it cleft habitus. I think same as habitus clive. Um, think we is the same um terminology so Nicola and myself wrote uh, this chapter in our Bourdieu next generation book um this chapter called stepping outside of oneself looking at how a cleft habitus can lead to greater reflexivity through occupying the third space so I kind of just wanted to mention start with a quote from Bourdieu because I love Bourdieu so much I actually forgot I was supposed to be wearing my this is what a Bourdieu Bourdieusian sociologist looks like t-shirt and here we are forgot about that <laughs> anyway so Bourdieu um uh writes my main problem is to try and understand what happened to me my trajectory may be described as miraculous I suppose an ascension to a place where I don't belong 
And so to be able to live in a world that is not mine, I must try to understand both things, what it means to have an academic mind, how such is created, and at the same time, what was lost in acquiring it. For that reason, even if my work, my full work, is a sort of autobiography, it is a work for people who have the same sort of trajectory and the same need to understand. So I found this quote really useful and definitely a reason that I'm very drawn towards you for my own also personal experience of, of social mobility. Um, and we find uh, we have found his concepts, as I as I see that you have very useful in helping us to uh, think about and uh, navigate the kind of misalign misalignment between habitus uh, in our research for working and middle class uh, worlds. And we are really fascinated by the question that Bourdieu poses to us, which is what, what does it mean to be able to live in a world that is not ours? And I think my thinking of this has developed through the years of being an academic and, and really living in that world. There is no world I feel comfortable in or feel a part of from my, my upbringing. Um, but anyway, so I think we need to really understand um, what are those separate worlds and the positions within them and how, how can we actually be in two spaces and two worlds at once and can we? And um, I think for me then a big um, thing that stuck, stuck stands out to me in your work is about the issue of, of race here and the difference in our work in that you are able to really pick out and highlight how the experience of moving between worlds and the habitus dislocation is much more, is felt much more acute for the Roma graduates first in the family, as opposed to the non-Roma um, first in family graduates. And so I'm saying that because I think a lot of my work has been challenging the, the negative view of a cleft habitus, which Bourdieu's work is very much about this tug and this, the psychic, the pain of it, which I can hear again coming in your work, and a lot of work highlights how problematic social mobility is for that reason. But something which we tried to do in this chapter, and also in work before that, um, where we write about uh, chameleon habitus, is to actually think about what can be gained from being in this position. What is the positive to being, to experiencing this divergent habitus and this cleft habitus? Actually, I would argue it can be extremely powerful. Um, and I did want to pose a, one question to you, actually, to your team. I, um, I'm not taking up all the question time, but just that when we get round to it, I'm really interested in whether you did actually experience anything coming out of your data on positivity about that position, um, because I think it's really important to bring that forward and say, you know, powerfully, actually, this, this can be a good thing for some people or there are some things that they can gain from that. Um, so, as I said, I, I think a different article where I write about the chameleon habitus is based a lot of, of this is based on local students. So working class students who live at home in their local community whilst attending an elite university. And this is, again, where I found an interesting overlap because I can see that you've talked about the geographical mobility um, and how that can, in a way, it seems to be saying what I found as well, that actually it could potentially protect um some young people or graduates from that habitus dislocation by staying within your community and that was where a lot of research says local university students uh have a problem in that they miss out on the experience of university or and they are stuck at home and they're in their home world and they are caught between two worlds and whilst that can be true what I also found is it enables people to feel more confident and comfortable in their identity and they have that support network and that community which is a lot of what you've also talked about today so I I won't bang on about that but um where was my left? so yeah, I think what we've done is use the Homi Baba and board you together to, to, to think this through. And we using Homi Baba's concept of the third space, which I think is really important. So I'm just going to just read um, what I said about that for a second in this chapter. Um, so we've written that the Ibaba's concept of the third space provides us with a useful way of thinking about what can be created from the painful experience of a cleft habitus. And what can be generated from the process of being forced to step outside of oneself? We have described what we're calling a reconciled habitus, wherein the structures of different fields have somehow been accommodated. 
we do not conceive of this as being about finding the common ground of different structures, but about something entirely new being created in their fusion. In passing through working class and middle class worlds, we have become class and cultural hybrids, belonging in neither and both places at once. We have been displaced to the third space and have recognized this displacement in our research participants too. So we're, we're reflecting on ourselves as well as them. Um, so I think, yeah, I guess I wondered whether you'd experienced any of this. And um, I was going to say, I you guys already kind of said it. For me, an implication and a really important thing we can do to support people in this experience is more creation of networks of support with mutual people in the same space so I think that's also why I like third space concept because we we can talk about it and think about how we maybe all similarly might be in a third space and how how what does that do for us and how can we use that to help people um, feel comfortable and feel understood um, in their identity and I definitely don't think I would be here as an academic today if I hadn't found colleagues and friends and peers in the acad academia who similarly occupy a third space position and even if it's not the same background as you there's something about that not fitting into either world where you can find a common ground um, of support um, and find a, a new space to, to, to speak from and a new perspective which gives you a good perspective into both different places. Um, yeah, so I, I'm usually really pessimistic and negative and I, I've come here talking a bit more optimistic for some reason. So yeah, I think um, that was really the main uh, comments that I had um, to make on that. And, and just um, to add, I don't know if you noted, because my only other thinking point or question to you guys that came up for me was about age, because you didn't mention so much age but connected to this is was there anything about um age at which somebody maybe experienced social mobility and whether that had any impact on their experience of their habitus dislocation or not um because i've personally reflected over the time about uh maybe something i think for me going from school and and being a younger student experiencing social mobility at a younger age has been different to, for example, Professor Diane Ray, or I think was mentioned, uh, going, becoming socially mobile at a, a mature student age, I think has affected her in a different way. I think it, it's, it's, it's different in terms of maybe the ease with which your habitus can adapt to the new, new situation if you've um, come at, at it through the kind of more traditional route. Um, yeah, so those were uh, my comments really for you. Thank you so much, Jesse. Thank you. Do you and others? Do you want to reply now, or shall we open the Q and A? Or shall I would we go love to. I would love to, if I may, just very, okay. very quickly. Or Jana, okay. Yuri, would you like to, or can I? Yeah. It, very important points, Jesse. <laughs> Third space. This is um, a paper that you wrote about. Again, inspired by this uh, this exact paper that you wrote about, and we are like trying to further develop your concept Ooh. the basis of the intersectionality of our cases great uh, because for you it's more like a mixedness of this uh, third space and we use uh, Yuva Davis's uh, conception of a place of marginality right anyway so we just try to use the racialization studies and whiteness studies to develop the concept so hopefully it's just about to be accepted let's hope for the compared journal of education mm -hmm. and that's the paper we wrote with abel abel beramin is the first author of this paper mm -hmm. so we will send it to you whenever it's ready yeah. because yeah. i think it's a really really important concept that something good something resourceful something creative mm -hmm. can come out of pain yes yes <laughs> and uh, that's why we really really find this how shall i say this um, research meaningful if you can show something how to beat up those people who think it's their individual individualized pain mm -hmm. and and faith and whenever they just like read some popular uh, account of our research one of my friends came to me that wow I always thought it's just me and I never understood why I'm suffering like mad 
in academia or in different sphere of life. And you won't believe it, Judith. Today, I went to see my psychologist and he said, I can't believe it. This is the, you are the third person today who mentioned this uh, as, as that it was the Cupid article that uh, one of our very mm, knowledgeable educational sociologist wrote like a most popular article about the research results, you know? So when people, even just when people realize that it's a common structural fate of those coming from working class and getting into elite position, and it's not that individual psychological problem, but it's a structural one. So they might just find community. But anyway, third space is a very important concept for us, yeah. So the second, the creation of network. I think Yuli's uh, presentation was just about that, that Roma realized this. And one of the slides I tried to show you that Lily's um, um, creation, crea creativity came from her pain of being lonely in Budapest, coming from a rural community. So she was one of the founder of Roma Vazitas because she wanted to help her peers not to go through the same loneliness process. So, and then this, and Yuli was part of Roma Net, uh, the, so she was a mentee of this Roma Vazitas and the emotional belonging and uh, the, the shelter that this kind of educational support program can give you. It's just really amazing and mitigate the price of the social mobility. And age, absolutely very important, very point. I think, Jana, we are indebted with this paper <laughs> to write, which we are so long planning to write about um, the intersectionality of age and gender and race because it was absolutely different economic and political regime as well mm -hmm. and our interviewees became socially mobile yeah so it might be quite complex then as well as <laughs> so that's why we never mm -hmm. had the time to write a paper on it but we will do thank you thank you Okay, I'd like to open the space for the audience to ask questions if they have. Uh, Andre, I can see the hand of Andre. Yeah, uh, thanks also for my side for this really, really interesting insight of your research. And I also think it's really important. It's amazing conducting like 175 biographical narrative interview. And I have a question according like how you analyze the interviews. Maybe it was like a little bit too, too fast for me, so I didn't uh, keep track of it. I, um, yeah, I, I saw you were using like uh, Atlas TI. So you were like using like I think a category-based uh, analytic method. And on the other hand, I'm also interested, um, what was the reasons for breaking uh, out, let's say, of the, the family structures. You said that there was like kind of frustrations, but maybe you found like also other things. And who, I mean, you mentioned that like also like support from the family, like, uh, like let's say educational aspiration, but did they also had like support from other people like teachers, for example, when we think of school? And the last question is um, what, what did they people studied and if you have like uh, based on like what they studied maybe there's like a pattern in terms of like the transformation of the habitus uh, for example thanks Jeanne I think you can answer the methodological question would you Yes, you are muted. Yes, sorry. Uh, so uh, we made a code book uh, to analyze the interviews. Uh, we followed two strategies. First, uh, deductive logics uh, based on the theories and the interview guide. We uh, elaborated codes. And we uh, also followed an inductive logic. So uh, based on the uh, data, we uh, elaborated new codes. And uh, when we uh, analyzed the 
topic we uh, choose the uh, codes that are relevant for the topic and uh, we read and categorize uh, the code. Okay, it was a really long process. So Jana was in charge of this. That's why I gave her the floor now. But we, for the trainees, we employed like for three or four months, uh, three trainees who helped us to code, do the coding. Each researchers who conducted uh, 15, each researchers kind of conducted 15 research re interviews except me and John who did like, I did 30, John did 25, something like that. So we did the most of it. And then we, um, most of the researchers had to uh, code, do the coding for their own interviews. And we did like workshops for how to code, whether we understand the same coding strategies, you know? So, and each interviews which were coded went through a checking. So either me or Jeanne checked the trainees, whether they did it right or not. So after a three months process, they were absolutely confident what we mean by this and this code. Yeah, the second question was, sorry, what was the question about the family? Uh, the reasons for breaking out was the second question. I mean, I, you mentioned frustration, but maybe there was like more reasons breaking out, let's say from the family or the oh, milieu. Okay, okay sorry. Uh, maybe it was misunderstandable. No one wanted to break out the family. They wanted to break out of poverty. They wanted to break out of the poverty of the family. So it was a very important findings that those could, only those could, um, keep the integrity of their personality or identity who kept a close relationship with their families. So even those who felt like a bit alienated at the beginning of the social mobility journey, they found their way back to their family. Otherwise it's too painful. So no one wanted to break out of family. Everyone wanted to break out of poverty, isn't it, Julie? So family is always the most important thing. And those paid the more the very very high prices as Jeanne told her in her slides whose family were not supported because they didn't understand the value of further studying but it was like a very very few cases in our big sample so most of the families were very very supportive and they valued education Yes, Jesse, absolutely. So they pro they wanted to break their family out of poverty as well. They wanted to have family, their family with the money. And that's why it's like, honestly, the Roma Vesitas mentees, they got the monthly stipendium, for example, something Jesse like a 50 pounds per month. And they sent home 40 pounds out of the 50 pounds, you know? And many of the trauma they spoke about was just imagine the feeling that I left my room of families, like let's say five, six kids, with the last uh, pennies of the family that they spent it to my travel, to my train ticket to get back to Budapest, to the uni, and they didn't have nothing to feed the other kids. So yes, thank you so much for the clarification. They wanted their family to break out of poverty. Are there any more questions from the audience? Andre? Yeah, I still have the questions like about uh, like what they studied because I'm also uh, doing research about like non-traditional students who becoming like a teacher. And so I'm interested like uh, what they studied and maybe there's like relations between, uh, let's say, the transformation of habitus or something, something like this. Okay, we can send you a paper. It's about that as well. So Jana analyzed the national statistical the, the census, the last census was 2011, and there is a huge difference what Roma and non-Roma first in family graduate studied. So Roma first in family graduate studied uh, humanities 
they were over represented represented in humanities and they don't study a uh, stem subject so science engineering finance they are very underrepresented <laughs> many many reasons one of them is the self-efficacy or the the, the, the the lack of self-efficacy. They believe that even the step is too high to big enough to study something like humanities, but to be at the top courses, it's not for a Roma. Because <laughs> there are no Roma among lawyers, no Roma among doctors. Uh, it was too big a step for them. They cannot ev couldn't even imagine this big step. But we can send you the paper, yeah? Yeah, yeah, this, this would be amazing. I just dropped my email in the chat. Amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, we can keep in touch. Uh, we don't have much uh, time left from the time frame we um, set. I don't know if anyone else has any more questions. Because if not, I'm happy to ask a question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, I had this impression that um, there is somehow in a there is a tension in how you grapple with uh, with this very rich material uh, in the analysis. I felt that you use Bourdieu in a way to describe very individual trajectories, perhaps because they often talk about loneliness and uh, and it comes from the biographical research. But at the same time, my impression is that you are very much touched about how uh, networks are created, how actually giving back to the community is a resource and uh, how giving back to the community means a way to, of enrichment, of personal enrichment, and how finding solidarity with others who are in the same traject doing the same trajectory actually uh, gives resources to the individual. So I was wondering to what, check, what, to what extent would you is useful to grasp this kind of collective experience or maybe good you should be used differently to grasp this aspect. I was wondering that you were talking about um, reconcile, individual, sorry, reconciled habitus. I was wondering if we could talk about uh, a collective reconciliation in any in any in any way in what you encountered. So yeah, my question is about the ways you see to ex to open up your framework to embrace these collective experiences. Who asked that? This is a very 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 good question. Thank you so much. I can see a potential, Jesse. I don't know whether you are with me in this, but I can see a potential of the third space concept as a space for the collective solidarity because um, but I can look for other literature and I think I should look we should look at for other literatures because the thing is that it's the huge material <laughs> empirical material um, we have to keep up with the reading as well so um, I think I might just find like we might just find new literature in the collective solidarity or network literature. If you have any idea, I'm open to it. I, I just want to add, I agree, I agree with you, um, you did, but and I think I think Bourdieu's theory absolutely does lend itself to thinking through about the collective. I think a lot of people we don't to kind of sometimes mis misunderstand Bourdieu in 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 the work, but you know if you think about the field as well, and think about um looking at the field as a concept, and the you know in terms of people's position within the field or um and the wider social space, or of course I think Bourdieu even talks about that collective maybe not it doesn't talk about it so much like how Marx might in the in a collective kind of way, but I think being in a similar place in social space even if you look at the fish in water and fish out of water to me that very much it is about the individual but it's really about the collective too and your position within the collective 
um, as an individual and how that how you relate to everybody. But then there is space for a community, particularly if you think about the community within your your space in the field and how you might have similar tastes, practice dispositions. So there's a lot of alignment between people and their habitus. So I think that makes space, like you said, to then potentially draw in something like the third space. But there is probably other work as well um, to help actually bring that forward and think about the community aspect of it. Yeah, and I think that, for example, this case study about Roma Varsitas is really about changing the field itself and transforming the social fabric or it's, a, it's about social transformation as well and how Roma graduate changed society as well. It just, yeah, just to open up board you and maybe the field or other concept could be helpful to understand the effect of their um, their becoming, you know, of of uh, of that they became uh, part of the elite and how they want to change society in their in their new positions. Mm. That's why, sorry, we use the bell hooks work. Sorry, not you, Davis. And bell hooks is speaking about this kind of uh, power of going against the hegemonic discourse. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening in these third spaces of Roma uh, first in family graduates that they really would like to challenge the main hegemonic discourses in academia, yeah, in the civil sector, and I think we they really it affected us a lot. Even this research was hugely influenced by them. That's amazing. And maybe even do you look at the? Uh, I think in my chapter I also use um. Patricia Hill Collins, I think she's fantastic at outsiders yeah. within because that's also a similar kind of framework. I think that's helpful for thinking about that and about the power of that position. And but of course, the heavy responsibility you can see like you you wrote it about how that is for them to be. It's very tokenistic or or very much like you can you are now responsible for resolving this and changing the experience for the future generation. But it's probably something they want to be a part of. But it, of course, it's very painful as well and very big challenge. Um, but yeah, it is a powerful, powerful place can be. I wonder if there are any more questions in the audience. Because if not, I will have the sad reward to close this session, but it was really, really exciting. And thank you so much for presenting this fabulous research. Thank you for inviting us. And thank you for coming. Thank you for everybody. Thank you. It was thank happy. You. Have a nice summer for everyone. Thank and hopefully you. see you in, some of you in Glasgow. Oh yeah. Bye -bye. And some of you at the Bourdieu conference. I was about to say, are you going to the Bourdieu conference? Yeah. In Barcelona? Are you coming? I'm coming, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Andre, are you coming to the Barcelona conference? Uh I'm not going to Barcelona, but I'm be we'll be in Glasgow. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, it would be great to see you guys there. Yes, nice would be lovely. Thank you, Esther, so for organizing this. Yeah, My thanks. Best. And have a lovely summer. See you. Yeah, thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.